find the river, R.E.M., it's a beautiful thing. And it, it's a key part in your story as well, because that's where you, you kind of make a performance at school, don't you? Yeah, the, the first time we played, it's, uh, played live was a school concert. Um, and I, saw, I sang with it and played with a bunch of la uh, guys from school. Um, Find the River, R.E.M., the very first thing I ever played live. And what uh, reaction? A positive one. And um, was that you then? Was that you? I'll, I like this. I'll have a bit more of this. Yeah, yeah. No, it was a, it was a good experience. It wasn't a, you know like there's a lot of we've had a lot of experience, different type of experiences over the course of you know certainly in the first ten years of our career where you know maybe five people show up to the gig, one person shows up to the gig. You know like. Um, but that first experience was a good one, so I think that did sort of, you know, light another little uh, fire in the in the brain. The spark was set off a yeah. little bit there. Uh, Dundee University then, uh, and, and you kind of head off to that. Yeah. And it's odd to have to go to Dundee to get together with mostly Northern Ireland guys, isn't it? But Started a Northern Irish band in Scotland, yeah. Um, it's I arrived in Dundee on the twenty first. The, no, excuse me, the 31st of September, um, 1994, and uh, met Mark McClelland on the 1st of October, 1994. We started a band that day, and I think we were right, like, you know, working together um, then that week, you know, in my- That was Shrug, was it? Uh, that was Shrug. Um, Really terrible name, but um, uh, yeah. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, it's the it's it's been the same. You know, it's been the same band ever since. A name change doesn't matter. There's so many bands that have had different names at the start. It doesn't matter. You know, this is the lineage. The 30 years that we've experienced has been this band. It's been always moving in this form. You know, form hasn't changed. People have. But. And things happen pretty quickly initially, don't they? Uh, you know, it's presumably that you then thought this is the way it goes. You know, you get a band together, you, you get signed to an indie label, everything's good. Initially, it was pretty quick, wasn't it? Certainly by the, in the first term at Dundee, we had our first gig in the Students' Union, and we were signed, I think, and we had a, an EP done in that first term as well. And we were signed at the start of 1995 by Jeepster Records, who just signed a band called Rhode Island. There's another name change, <laughs> um, who would go on to be called Bell and Sebastian. Mm. And they, they would have a massive success with, with the Bells. They, we didn't have massive success, success for them, um, unfortunately, but because uh, um, they're a great bunch of people. Did the academic studies just go to the wall or did you try to balance both playing and band and also doing some studies or did you just use your university experience to I, do the band thing? I did, unfortunately. Not, like, I, I think about it a lot. Like, I but a guilt there still, is it? Yeah, 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 yeah. I think, I think about doing a, a degree. Like, I have a degree, right? I, 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 I crammed for my exams and I got my degree, but I didn't. I, the, what I have learned in my life uh, has been post-university. <laughs> I had this, all this knowledge available at my, um, you know, uh, uh, at my fingertips, and I just didn't, you know, I, I, I I kind of wasted it, um, and I think about doing a, another degree all the time um, to kind of make up for it. Um, but uh, but yeah, it was pretty much the band took over everything. But the love of literature was always there, and that goes back to, to school as well, doesn't it? And, and the, the, the interest and the passion for the, the Seamus Heaney's of this world and the great writers yes. from this country. I mean, that's always been there. Yeah, um, my English teacher, Mr. McKay and I, so you still I call just, him Mr. McKay. I do, I do. Um, I, 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 when I see him, I, I, I call him Mark, but it feels weird. Um, <laughs> but uh, he, um, he introduced us to all of us. Davy Matchett, he's over there, um, uh, absolute legend of a man. Um, and Davy and I were in the same class at school, and we were sat beside each other because light body match it, you know. So uh, L and M. Um, so uh, that's how we met, and Miss McKee was our English teacher, and introduced us to Seamus Heaney, to Bob Dylan, and to Van Morrison, 
Um, so it wasn't just an English class or a conventional English class. Um, it was, uh, you know, it just it felt like another, you know, it felt like life lessons more than anything. You know, like he would re he read. I didn't really listen at school that much. I'm not very academically minded. I love reading now um, and over the last, since I left school and university, even more than I did when I was there. Um, but um, then I wasn't really awake in class and he read Digging by Seamus Heaney. Um, and I went, I'm sorry, what just happened? It was mm. like, so Nirvana and Seamus Heaney are the two biggest influences in my life because Nirvana made me want to play guitar again, pick, take a guitar out of the back of the cupboard and Seamus Heaney made me want to write words, write lyrics, write poems. And what is it about Heaney uh, and the great works of Heaney that still speak to you? Because they still do, don't they, Gary? With the greatest of humility um, I, I, like, and, and reverence, I, 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 I turned some of Seamus Heaney's poetry into songs for, for an event recently um, at uh, Queen's University celebrating the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement called Seamus Heaney Center Presents Hope. And um, so I did three of his poems, uh, turned them into, into songs. It's been quite emotional for you, that. It was an emotional night, actually. Um, and it's like really nerve wracking. <laughs> I haven't felt that nervous walking on stage in a long, long time because it's not my, and I have a terrible habit of forgetting words. <laughs> So I was like, my eyes were just like laser focused on like, just to make sure I didn't forget any words at all. Um, and uh, I th think I did okay. But, um, but yeah, he's still a big part of my life, you know? And um, obviously his connection with this island that we all live on, north, south, east and west. Um, but his, I think something just resonates something just reverberates in my soul when i read him that i don't i it doesn't happen often you know in there's a life. humanity there isn't there there's a decency and a yeah a humanity there one of the things that, that always interests me about the snow patrol story gary is the resilience because <laughs> you mentioned it in passing you're you say talking resilience i say belligerence but okay belligerence well they're, they're closely related in a way aren't they because you're talking a decade where things don't click the way you'd hoped they'd clicked and you'd hoped that things would happen really quickly. And, you know, commercially it doesn't happen, but you stick with it. Other yeah. people may have said, well, you know, it's not working. We'll, we'll knock it in the head, but you stick with it and the success comes. Have you ever looked back on that and thought, why did we have that belligerence, as you say? I don't know. It's um, gotta be a drive. It's gotta be something in you. Keep yeah, because there was so many, there was literally p people, friends, family going, what are you, what are you doing? You know, what are you doing? Um, surely you've got to knock this on the head at some point. Um, Did not you all, ever not get all, to that level? No. Not all my friends, by the way. Um, some friends were supportive all the way through, but, uh, um, but, but some, some people were like questioning. And not in, not, not, not in any kind of like, oh, you know, maybe, you know, uh, to, you know, when I wasn't there, but, um, <laughs> but, but to me, they were more concerned, you know, but like, like, you, you know, you, this isn't going to happen. You know, it doesn't happen after 10 years, you know, the amount of bands that have been going 10 years and then have success is like, you know, you can count on one hand. And, um, you know, so it's a very, um, it's very unlikely this happens. So what was the reason? Um, it's the only thing I ever wanted to do. I knew that once I gave it up, that was it. A part of me would die. Like a part of me would never, I'd never get it back. So I guess I just- You had no option. Wanna, I didn't wanna quit. It was gonna have to be like, someone's gonna have to just take this from me because <laughs> I can't let go of it. Um, so yeah, it was, foolhardy in a lot of ways. I mean, it paid off of, you know, I say obviously everybody might know the story, plenty of people don't know the story. Um, but like, you know, when we had, even when Run became a hit, it was, it was by accident, really. Not by accident, it was, it was, it was out of our control. You know, Joe Wiley 
bless her for always. Thank you, Joe, again. <laughs> Um, played all six minutes of run. People might have thought at the time, oh, you guys are sold out. I made run, I deliberately made run six minutes long so that it would never be a single. That's how attached I was to my indie. I was like, I'm not giving it, I don't care. I've, okay, I've written some choruses in this album, but it doesn't matter. I'm gonna, I'm gonna sink this ship. Uh, I'll figure out a way to break it. <laughs> and, um, and Joe Wiley was not deterred. She played the whole thing on Daytime Radio 1 and it changed, it changed everything.